Welcome back to Think for Christ. Today we're going to be looking at the Kalam cosmological argument. We're going to do this in two parts because this argument has a lot going on. Please do remember that this is an introduction to the Kalam cosmological argument. I am well aware of the issues that the argument raises in the philosophy of science and in the philosophy of time. Unfortunately, due to the nature of this introduction, we will not be covering these deeper philosophical issues. The Kalam cosmological argument was first presented as an argument against Aristotle's idea that the world was eternal by the Alexandrian Christian John Philoponus in the 6th century AD. Following the Islamic conquest of North Africa, the argument was inherited and further developed by Muslim theologians before it was then retransmitted to Jewish and Christian scholastics in the late Middle Ages. After a period of dormancy, the argument came roaring back into prominence on the heels of Big Bang cosmology, and thanks in large part to the philosophical rigor that it was given by philosopher William Lane Craig, who remains today the argument's staunchest defender. It is Craig who dubbed the argument as the Kalam cosmological argument, in honor of the central role that the argument played in medieval Islamic theology and the development that it received at the hands of Muslim thinkers such as al-Ghazali. Now, as I stated last time, though they have some similarities, the Kalam is actually a distinct argument from the Leibnizian argument, so it stands on its own, and therefore, if it's sound, it provides independent support for that argument. Now, the key differences between the two is that whereas the Leibnizian argument is concerned with the contingency of the universe, the Kalam is concerned with the temporal finitude of the universe, or the fact that the universe began to exist a finite time ago. The formulation of the Kalam is disarmingly simple and can be stated like this. Premise 1. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise 2. The universe began to exist. And therefore, the universe has a cause. Like the Leibnizian argument, this is a deductive argument that is formally valid. If the premises are true, then, the conclusion follows with logical certainty. Now, there are just two premises in the Kalam. We'll look at them each in turn. Premise 1 states that whatever begins to exist has a cause. This premise is simply a statement of the causal principle that's at the heart of the argument, or the principle of causality. The principle is rooted in the common sense intuition that something cannot come into being from nothing, or from nothing, nothing comes. Because to come into existence without a cause is precisely to come into existence from nothing. The causal principle is closely related to the principle of sufficient reason, or the PSR, that we looked at last time in the Leibnizian argument. This is because all causes are explanations, and whatever causes a thing to exist will be an explanation for the existence of that thing. In fact, the causal principle is actually a more modest principle than the principle of sufficient reason. Recall that the, the PSR says that Anything that exists has an explanation of its existence. The causal principle, on the other hand, is more restricted, since it simply states that anything that begins to exist has a cause. But why think that the principle of causality is true? Why think that whatever begins to exist must have a cause? Well, because the causal principle is so closely related and yet more modest than the principle of sufficient reason, all of the arguments that we looked at in favor of the PSR last time will equally apply to the causal principle. Now, I'll briefly review the arguments here. You can refer to the previous episode on the Leibnizian cosmological argument for a more thorough presentation. So, like the PSR, the causal principle at work in this argument enjoys universal inductive support. The things of our experience that come into being always have causes. And the world simply does not function as if the causal principle were false. A world where things could just pop into being without a cause would be a chaotic and unpredictable mess, as opposed to our world, which is orderly, predictable, and stable. The principle of causality is also a self-evident truth. We can see that this principle is true simply by means of a kind of metaphysical intuition. And the causal principle, like the PSR, functions as a kind of fundamental principle of reason and rationality. And as with the PSR, a rejection of the principle of causality leads to radical perceptual skepticism. 
Denying the causal principle undermines all of our empirical knowledge, including and especially our scientific knowledge. If things could just pop into existence without a cause, then so could our perceptions and our memories. And without a causal principle, there would be no way for us to say that this scenario would be unlikely or improbable, as we saw last time. For all we know, most of what we take ourselves to know could come about in this random way, which of course would destroy our knowledge. Nowadays, it's common to hear it said that quantum physics provides us with an exception to the causal principle. Some physicists claim that according to quantum mechanics, so-called virtual particles can pop into being out of nothing. But this popular claim is at best badly confused, and at its worst, it's highly misleading. And I think at least sometimes, and from some physicists, it's deliberately misleading. Even if virtual particles exist, and this is a subject that is hotly debated among physicists, they simply do not represent an example of something coming into being from nothing. According to the model, virtual particles are said to spontaneously fluctuate into existence from the subatomic vacuum. However, this subatomic vacuum is definitely not nothing. It is rather a sea of fluctuating energy that contains physical structure and is subject to physical laws. As we saw in a previous episode, nothingness is not a slight exotic kind of something, but it's rather the absence of anything. As such, nothingness can have no energy, no properties, no structure, and it can enter into no relations. Nothingness cannot be constrained, it cannot be limited, and it cannot be physically described. This rudimentary mistake is also made by physicists who suggest that the universe can pop into being from nothing so long as there are laws of nature. In their book, The Grand Design, Stephen Hawking and Leonard Mladenow write this, quote, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing, end quote. And in his book titled A Universe from Nothing, Lawrence Cross says, quote, the laws themselves require our universe to come into existence, to develop and evolve, end quote. But laws of nature will not help get a universe from nothing. There's two obvious reasons for this. First, the laws of nature are not prescriptive. They're descriptive. They don't cause anything to happen. Rather, they simply describe the way that already existing things in the world interact with each other. To think that the laws could somehow be responsible for the coming to be of the universe is to commit a category mistake. Now, second and more to our point here, the laws of nature are obviously not nothing. They are clearly something. So even if the laws could somehow make it possible for the universe to come into being, which they can't, it would still not be a case of something coming from nothing. But why can't we grant the causal principle and just say that the universe caused itself to be, or that the universe brought itself into existence rather than appealing to some external cause of its existence? Again, although physicists will sometimes talk this way, the idea of self-causation is simply logically incoherent. And this is because for a thing to bring itself into being, it would have to exist before it existed. But that's a clear contradiction. Sometimes it's suggested that the universe as a whole should be exempted from the causal principle. In other words, why can't we say that the causal principle is true for things in the universe, but that it's not true of the universe itself? Well, the problem with this suggestion is that it simply misunderstands the causal principle by treating it as if it were a physical law or a physical principle that applies only within the universe. But the causal principle is not a physical principle that's restricted to this or that domain of being. Rather, it's a metaphysical principle that applies to being itself or to all being. It says that being of any kind cannot come from non-being. Now, this is not a contingent claim that depends on some set of existing conditions. It's rather an unrestricted principle that holds for all of reality. Okay, I think we've said enough here to see that premise one is on very strong ground indeed. In fact, I think that the principle that whatever begins to exist has a cause is virtually undeniable. No sincere seeker of truth really believes that things could just pop into existence from nothing without a cause. 
And if someone is forced to reject the first premise of the Kalam in order to avoid the conclusion, I would personally consider such a move a tacit admission of the strength of this argument. In my opinion, to reject the premise that whatever begins to exist has a cause is just a desperate attempt to avoid an unwanted conclusion. The critical premise in the Kalam cosmological argument, then, will be premise two, which states that the universe began to exist. There are very good reasons to think that premise two is, in fact, true. Those reasons can be grouped into two general kinds. The first consists of philosophical arguments, and the second of scientific confirmation. The philosophical arguments in support of premise two are dense, and they're difficult to grasp on the first go-around, and they bring up all sorts of interesting philosophical questions that are beyond the scope of this episode. So for our purposes here, I'm going to offer an introductory sketch of each of these arguments by way of illustration. There are actually three independent philosophical arguments in support of the second premise of the Kalam cosmological argument. The first is the argument from the impossibility of an actual infinite number of things. The second is the argument from the impossibility of forming an actual infinite by successive addition. And the third is the argument from the impossibility of an infinite causal sequence. The first two arguments show that the universe cannot be infinitely old, and therefore that it had to begin to exist at some time in the finite past. And the third argument is designed to show that even if the universe could be infinitely old, events cannot have an infinite number of causes regressing into the past. Now, before we can sketch these arguments, we first need to say something about the concept of infinity. There are actually two kinds of infinities that we can talk about. There is first what is called a potential infinite, and then what is called an actual infinite. A potential infinite is symbolized by the so-called lazy eight, and it describes a collection which is at every point finite, but always growing towards infinity as a limit. The concept of a potential infinite is not that of a number, but it's that of a limit that's approached by a series but never actually attained. A potential infinite never actually arrives at infinity, which is why it's called a potential infinite, but merely approaches infinity endlessly. To illustrate a potential infinite, you can think of a line and then imagine dividing it in half, and then dividing that half in half, and then that half in half. It's conceivable to mentally continue this operation indefinitely, yet still you would never actually reach an infinite number of divisions, but would rather approach infinity as a kind of limit. In contrast to this, an actual infinite, symbolized by the Hebrew letter Aleph, describes a collection that actually has an infinite number of members. Unlike a potential infinite, which approaches infinity as a limit, an actual infinite is an infinite set of discrete items. To illustrate an actual infinite, simply consider the set of all natural numbers, one, two, three, four, and so on. This represents a collection that is conceptually infinite, since there's no highest natural number. For any natural number that you choose, there will always be a higher number. Now, the distinction between a potential and actual infinite is important to keep in mind when considering the first two philosophical arguments for the finitude of the past. These arguments are concerned with actual infinites and not potential infinites. Mixing the two notions of infinity will lead to misunderstanding. So many of the criticisms that I've seen that target these philosophical arguments in support of the second premise of the Kalam confuse the notion of a potential infinite and an actual infinite. What these arguments are going to rule out is the existence of an actual infinite. Potential infinites are just fine. Okay, with that out of the way, let's look at the first philosophical argument, the argument from the impossibility of an actual infinite number of things. The argument goes like this. Premise one, an actual infinite cannot exist. Premise two, an infinite temporal regress of events is an actual infinite. Therefore, an infinite temporal regress of events cannot exist. Now, clearly, if this argument goes through, then the number of past events could not be infinite. In other words, the universe could not be beginningless. It must have begun to exist a finite time ago. But why think that an actual infinite cannot exist? 
Well, the reason is that if an actually infinite number of things could exist, then all sorts of absurdities could result. Now, the best way to show this is by illustration. There are famous illustrations that could be offered here, such as the famous Hilbert's Hotel. But for the sake of being concise, let's just consider a library that contains an infinite collection of books. Now, we can imagine that the books in this library are numbered one, two, three, and so on, out to infinity. Now, let's suppose that you check out all the odd-numbered books from this collection, so book one, book three, book five, and so on to infinity, leaving only the even-numbered books in the library, book two, book four, book six, and so on to infinity. Now, since the number of odd-numbered books is infinite, you've checked out an infinite number of books. Now we can ask, how many books would be left in the library in this scenario? Well, the answer is an infinite number of books. When we check out an infinite amount of odd-numbered books from the total collection of books, we're still left with an infinite collection of even-numbered books in the library. So infinity minus infinity equals infinity. But what if instead of checking out all the odd-numbered books, we check out all the books that are numbered greater than 12? Well, as in the previous case, we would once again be checking out an infinite number of books, all the books numbered greater than 12. But this time, when we ask the same question about how many books would remain in the library, we get a different answer. There will only be 12 books left. So once more, we've checked out an infinite number of books from the library as before. But now, instead of an infinite number of books remaining in the library, there are only 12 books remaining in the library. In this case, infinity minus infinity equals 12. So we've subtracted identical quantities from identical quantities, and yet we've arrived at different answers. But this is clearly absurd, and therefore an actually infinite collection of things must not be possible in the real world. Now, the common response to this argument is that despite the metaphysical absurdities that would follow from the existence of actual infinites in the real world, we know that they are, in fact, possible because we have a mathematical system that deals with them, namely infinite or Cantorian set theory. So, at best, these illustrations show that infinity is just weird or that it leads to counterintuitive situations and results. But we can't say from these illustrations that infinities are impossible because infinite set theory is a logically consistent mathematical system. But this very common response simply misses the point. The argument is not saying that actual infinites are logically impossible, but rather that they are ontologically impossible. The argument is not saying that the notion of an actual infinite is incoherent or contradictory. It's not. But rather that an actual infinite collection of things cannot exist in reality. As an axiomatized system, infinite set theory is logically consistent. If you adopt the rules of set theory, then you can talk about infinities without contradicting yourself. But it doesn't follow from this that an actual infinite collection of things is actually possible in reality. On the contrary, the absurdities that would result from the existence of an actual infinite show that they are in fact not possible in the real world. In fact, I think that this is evident from the axioms of set theory itself, which prohibits inverse arithmetic operations performed with transfinite numbers. These operations are prohibited precisely because if they were allowed, they would lead to absurdities, as the infinite library illustration shows. But the arbitrary rules of set theory have no force in the real world. If a library with an actual infinite number of books existed in the real world, the axiomatic rules of set theory could not stop a person from checking out books, and then the absurd consequences would follow. So actual infinities are not able to be instantiated in reality because they would make possible many absurd situations. And since a beginningless universe would contain an actually infinite number of events, our universe must be finite in duration it must have come into existence at some time in the finite past. The second philosophical argument for the finitude of the past is the argument from the impossibility of forming an actual infinite by successive addition. Here's how this one goes. Premise one, a collection formed by successive addition cannot be an actual infinite. 
premise two. The temporal series of events is a collection formed by successive addition. Therefore, the temporal series of events cannot be an actual infinite. So in this argument, we're not ruling out the existence of an actual infinite as the first argument does. Rather, we're denying that an actual infinite can be formed by adding one member after another. Since the series of past events is formed in this way, one event following another, it cannot be infinite. And once more, the universe cannot be beginningless. Now, it's worth repeating here that this argument is entirely independent from the prior one, so that even if the first argument is false, this one can still be true. Of course, either argument would rule out a beginningless past. Another way to state this argument is to say that it's impossible to traverse or pass through an infinite number of elements one at a time. To see this, just imagine trying to count to infinity. No matter how long you count, you'll never reach an infinitieth number, because no matter how high of a number you do reach, there will always be an infinity of numbers still left to count. But if you can't count to infinity, then you can't count from infinity either. Imagine counting down from all the negative numbers and ending at zero. Since there are an infinite number of negative numbers prior to zero, before any negative number could be counted, you'd have to count an infinity of numbers first. So, no matter how long you've been counting for, you'll never reach zero. In fact, you'll always be at infinite distance from reaching zero. To illustrate the problem here for a beginningless universe, think about an infinite sequence of dominoes where each domino falls one by one until the final domino in the sequence falls. We can think about the last domino in this illustration as the present moment or as representing today. Now, if there's an actually infinite sequence of dominoes that must fall before the final domino falls, then it doesn't seem possible for the final domino to ever fall, since before any domino could fall, an infinite number of dominoes must have fallen first. Likewise, if there is an actually infinite sequence of events existing before today, it doesn't seem possible for today to have arrived, and for the same reason. Yet here we are. Today has arrived. Again, what this means is that the series of past events cannot be infinite or beginningless. The series of past events that make up the history of the universe must be finite. There had to be a beginning of the universe. The third philosophical argument in support of premise two of the Kalam is the argument from the impossibility of an infinite causal sequence. Unlike the first two philosophical arguments for the Kalam, which show that the universe must have a finite past, this argument proves that every event has a finite causal history, a notion that is called causal finitism in the philosophical literature. So whereas the first two arguments, if sound, prove that there cannot be an actually infinite number or sequence of past events or an infinite regress of events, this argument, if sound, proves that there cannot be an actually infinite number of causes for any single event or an infinite regress of causes. The argument can be formulated this way. Premise one, if the universe is past infinite, then there could be an infinite number of things causally prior to one thing. Premise two, an infinite number of things cannot be causally prior to one thing. Therefore, the universe is not past infinite. The argument for causal finitism is best shown by assuming the existence of an infinite causal series, and then showing that from this assumption, causal paradoxes follow. Now, there are many such paradoxes in the literature today. Let's consider a popular one called the Grim Reaper Paradox. In this paradox, we first imagine a victim. Let's call him Fred, who, sadly enough, has been sentenced to beheading by a Grim Reaper. And unfortunately for Fred, there's not just one Reaper who's been assigned to kill him, but an infinite number of them. Each Reaper is given the same set of instructions. First, the Reaper is to check to see if Fred has been killed by another Reaper. If Fred is dead, the Reaper does nothing. If Fred is still alive, the Reaper swings his sigh and beheads poor Fred. Now, imagine that the Grim Reapers are organized sequentially over the time span of one minute, with each Reaper being assigned a distinct and specific point of time in which they're to act. So, Reaper number one is set to act at one minute after midnight. Reaper number two is set to act at 30 seconds after midnight. 
Reaper number three, 15 seconds after midnight. Reaper number four, 7.5 seconds after midnight. And so on to infinity, with each consecutive Reaper getting closer and closer to midnight without there ever being a first Grim Reaper after midnight. The first Reaper in this scenario is actually the last one, the one set to act at 12.01. Obviously, Fred is screwed. If he encounters even one Grim Reaper, he's surely a dead man. A Grim Reaper cannot fail in his deadly task. But for Fred to last even one second after midnight, he has to survive an infinite number of Grim Reapers. So there's no way that Fred gets to one minute after midnight with his head on his shoulders. But there's a problem here. It doesn't seem like any particular Grim Reaper in the sequence can actually kill Fred, since before any Reaper in the sequence can have a chance to swing his sigh, there will have been an infinite number of Reapers who would have done the job already. So on the one hand, Fred is definitely killed by a Grim Reaper. But on the other hand, there's no particular Grim Reaper who could have possibly killed him. But this is clearly a contradiction. It's a logically impossible scenario. Now, this paradox can be easily modified to show that the universe cannot have an infinite causal history. We just need to tweak some details. Let's imagine again an infinite number of Grim Reapers spread out over time. And again, that each Reaper is given the same set of instructions to perform at a specific time, a task that once again, they cannot fail to execute. Except this time, the task is simply to receive a lantern from a previous Reaper. If the lantern is already lit when received, the Reaper simply passes it on to another Reaper without doing anything at all. If the lantern is unlit when the Reaper receives it, the Reaper is to light the lantern before passing the now lit lantern on to another Reaper. Now, let's imagine again that our Reapers are ordered sequentially, with each Reaper being assigned to pass the lantern to the next Reaper at midnight on January 1st of a certain year. So, Reaper number 1 is assigned to pass the lantern on 1 BC. Reaper number 2 is assigned to pass the lantern on 2 BC. Reaper number 3 on 3 BC. Reaper number 4 on 4 BC. And so on, backwards in time, infinitely. So here, we have a beginningless sequence of Reapers regressing into the past. Now, there's no question that the lantern in this scenario will be lit since there are an infinite number of Reapers to ensure that the job gets done. But again, it's also certain that no particular Reaper could have lit the lamp, since for any Reaper in any year, there will have been an infinite number of Reapers coming before who would have lit the lamp already. So once again, we have a contradiction. Now, what makes these causal paradoxes so powerful is that they actually generate logical contradictions rather than just ontologically absurd scenarios as with the first two philosophical arguments. In the first scenario, Fred is both killed by a Reaper and not killed by any particular Reaper, and that's a contradiction. In the second scenario, the Lantern is both lit by a Reaper and not lit by any particular Reaper, again, a contradiction. This makes the argument for causal finitism even stronger than the two arguments we looked at for temporal finitism. If a causal infinite were allowed, then contradictions become possible. But this is not just metaphysically absurd, it's incoherent. It cannot possibly be true even in a broadly logical sense. So the argument for causal finitism is sound. There cannot be an infinite regress of causes. But if there cannot be an infinite regress of causes, then the universe cannot be past infinite. It cannot be beginningless. It had to begin to exist sometime in the finite past. So in support of the crucial premise of the Kalam cosmological argument that the universe began to exist, we have three independent philosophical arguments. But as I've said, there's more. The premise also receives striking support from modern astronomy and astrophysics. We'll consider this evidence next time as we continue our look at the Kalam cosmological argument.